Good morning everyone, welcome to our 8am service and a special welcome to those who are joining us online. Let us begin with the greeting. The Lord be with you and also with you. Our sentence of scripture for today, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom, to whom all hearts are open, open all desires known, and, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, grant that we may grow in faith, hope and love, and that we may obtain what you promised. Make us love what you command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our Bible readings. The epistle comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, 
righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm reading for today is Psalm 131, uh, a short psalm that reminds us of the greatness of God, that he is God and we are not. And there are some things that are too wonderful for us to comprehend. Let me read it for us. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself in great matters or in things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child upon its mother's breast. Like a child on its mother's breast is my soul within me. O Israel, trust in the Lord from this time forward and forever. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Jesus, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus, Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us together affirm what we believe with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, who came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. It's great to see you here today. I somewhat expected we might have a smaller congregation given the weather. Perhaps we have some more online. Welcome to you as well. Um, it's wonderful to gather here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In case we haven't met, my name's Andrew Schmidt, and the people leading the service with me are Emma, Philippa, and Jim. Uh, if you are new or visiting with us today, uh, you are very welcome here, and I certainly hope that you'll join us for morning tea in the parish room afterwards in that direction. Uh, we, we use uh, this uh, comment card or the visitor's card or even new, uh, regular person's card because it's something that can be used if you wanted to jot down a, a prayer point or a comment or indicate in any way how the ministry team could help you here. Um, we'd, I'd love you to, to hear from you in that way. Uh, and as I always say, it's, it's something that I certainly hope our regular members will use to, to share a prayer point or something like that. Our staff team always prays for the congregation on Tuesday mornings, uh, and uh, so that's something that we would uh, love to be able to do in a more informed way. Um, I thankfully don't have too many announcements this morning. Uh, we've come through a busy time. And there, there are, there's only one really uh, significant uh, calendar event in November, uh, apart from our regular Sunday services. That's our uh, women's Christmas event, which Emma talked about last week. So the details about that are on the back of the bulletin, and I uh, certainly hope that you'll get your tickets because uh, there's a limited number of them. So uh, let me lead us in prayer now as we turn to God's word. Heavenly Father, you are very good to us uh, in speaking to us uh, about your son, Jesus, whom you sent into the world for us. So please calm and quiet our souls at this time and enable us to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Extravagance. Extravagance is uh, the, the opening concept for today. Uh, you may remember several, several marriages back of uh, James Packer, uh, once uh, nearly Australia's richest man. Uh, his, his first marriage was a highly publicised one because his father, Kerry, was still alive and was really wanting to make it an amazing occasion as he, 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 uh, his son got married. And I remember reading that the Packer family gave a, a $10,000 gift, I think for men it was, uh, for it was a watch, and for women it was a lovely piece of jewellery, a $10,000 gift to each one of the guests at James and Jody Packer's wedding. Uh, now, as I recall, um, Catherine and I, who got married about the year before, uh, or maybe a year after, we also gave a present to everyone who attended our wedding. It was a small hexagonal box of sugared almonds. The Packer offering was quite extravagant, wasn't it? People were actually asked not to bring gifts because whatever gift they brought was going to be overshadowed by the gift they received. Uh, extravagance, it, it raises an interesting question, doesn't it? You know, when, when is it too extravagant? When should the extravagance be spent on something else? Uh, should the money have been saved, which would have broadcast uh, King Charles's coronation onto the Opera House? Uh, you know, was that going to be too extravagant? Uh, should, should Melbourne have canned their Commonwealth Games? Uh, or, you know, these are the questions about extravagance. When is it appropriate? Well, uh, this question about the appropriateness of extravagance was prompted by a memorable act of devotion which was performed on Jesus a few days before his death. We've seen in recent weeks how, as Jesus got closer to Jerusalem, essentially he was in more and more danger. And he's been coming and going, making strategic withdrawals from Jerusalem because of opposition. But now at the start of chapter 12, 
Jesus returned again to Bethany near Jerusalem, coming back into harm's way for the last time. Because, you see, this is only a week before his death. Even though it's only halfway through John's Gospel, it's only a week before Jesus' death. His friends don't realise that. They feel, they believe he's simply coming to the Passover celebration and that Jesus wouldn't be deterred from going to Jerusalem by opposition because he wants to be there for the Passover. Now, as was his practice, he stayed in Bethany, this little town a couple of kilometres out from Jerusalem, and they made a dinner there in his honour. Now, Lazarus, as you know, was a, he was a prominent member of the Bethany community, and so I suppose it's not surprising that he was invited to the dinner, but, uh, but what a great detail that is, isn't it? That Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead, was there reclining at the table with him. It just brings home the stunning nature of the miracle that Jesus had performed, that the man that he'd called out of his grave was now there dining with him. Now, it was during the dinner that Lazarus' sister Mary performed this memorable act of devotion. Uh, it obviously wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. She, she decided, she had decided she would do it. It was something she wanted to do for Jesus. She came with an extremely expensive bottle of perfume and while they're at the table, she poured the bottle out on Jesus' feet. Matthew and Mark also say that she poured some of it on his head. John tells us that the house was filled with the fragrance. Sounds like John's own experience there, doesn't it? He would have been at the dinner. This is an extravagant gesture of devotion, isn't it? It used up all this expensive perfume in one go. And once the beautiful aroma, which filled the house, had dissipated, well, there would have been nothing left. I was once uh, at a house when a friend of a friend set up a sparkler bomb. He had been to the shops and he'd bought about $200 worth of sparklers, which seemed like an enormous amount of money to me in those days. It was the days of working part-time jobs and it would have taken me many hours to earn that amount of money. Well, he strapped all of these sparklers together in a sort of cylindrical shape and he used one of them as a wick. He placed it in a sort of a slot that he'd created in the ground. He lit up the wick, stepped back, and we saw the sparkler bomb go off. Now, uh, if, you've, if you've ever seen one go off, what happens is there's this amazing shaft of sparkly fire that just goes up into the sky for, ooh, it was 10 seconds maybe? It's faster than a normal sparkler will burn just on its own. Now, we all loved watching this sparkler bomb, and then it was over. And my friend of a friend had literally taken 10 seconds to burn $200. I'm sure that the aroma of Mary's perfume, which was much, much more valuable than the $200, I'm sure it would have remained longer than 10 seconds, would have filled the house for quite some time. But the analogy is that this was an expensive gesture that was all over very quickly. And I guess that's the way with extravagant gestures. It, and, and, and that's why it raises the question about whether it's justified. And, and that's why Mary's gesture led to what actually is quite a complex ethical discussion. Judas opened up the debate. He said, listen, what a waste. Think how much we could have raised for the poor if we'd sold this perfume. Now, there's a superficial correctness to his argument, isn't there? The perfume is a luxury item. It's the sort of thing that you would buy from that posh and eerily quiet level at Bondi Junction, Westfield, where shops like Prada are located. In our money, it's worth thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. You could do a lot of good with it. Why is it on this extravagant gesture? Uh, now, John, uh, who of course was one of the 12 apostles with Judas, lets us in on the hypocrisy behind Judas's question. 
Judas would have definitely liked to see the proceeds of selling that perfume in the disciples' money bag because he used to help himself to what was in there. And that reminds us that ethical decisions are not made in an ivory tower. They're made amongst real people who have all sorts of good and bad motivations. People talk about virtue signalling these days, which is a, a form of hypocrisy which is all about showing how good you are while not actually caring for the people you claim to care about. Judas's words here just go to show you that virtue signalling is as old as the human race. But Jesus doesn't call out Judas's virtue signalling, does he? He, he? he actually offers an answer to the question. And what I want you to notice is that Jesus makes it about himself. Have a look there in verse 8. Jesus says, you will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. Now, normally, we can't stand a person who makes everything about themselves, can we? You know, it's usually very tedious to be talking with one of those people that always brings the conversation, no matter what the topic is, back to themselves. But you see, Jesus does that right here, doesn't he? And it's something that he often did. And that's because Jesus is the only person with the right to put himself at the centre. What is it that justifies Mary's extravagance here? Well, the dinner guest is the king of the universe. If you had the king of the universe as your dinner guest, wouldn't you provide the best that you had in your house? And not only that, he's not only the king of the universe, but he's actually, he's the king of the universe that's reached out to be Mary's friend. Now, if, if he had reached out to be your friend, as in fact he has done for everyone who's a Christian, don't you want to do something to show Jesus your devotion? I mean, if we don't feel overwhelming love and a desire to show our devotion to the Lord Jesus, I mean, what is wrong with us? That's not even to mention the significant time this is all taking place, a week before Jesus will die to save the world. I have never thought that Mary realised about Jesus' coming death. Now, it's possible that, Jesus, that Mary had been given some prophetic knowledge that Jesus was going to die, and that's what led her to anoint Jesus that day. It's equally possible that this is simply an act of devotion that she wanted to perform. Either way, Jesus himself saw this anointing uh, as a precursor to his burial. It was only a week later that they would be anointing his dead body with the spices for burial. No one who, who understands who Jesus is and what he was about to do could possibly suggest that there was a better use for the perfume than this extravagant gesture that Mary performed. She wanted to honour him. It's funny, people think of Jesus' teachings as the basis of our ethics, and they are. But when Jesus spoke, his teaching was almost never purely ethical. Uh, very rarely would Jesus speak in terms of giving us a list of instructions, do this, do this, don't do that. His teaching always had to do with his identity. He brought it back to who he is. And quite frequently, he was also bringing it back to the death that he was going to die to save the world. And Jesus expected the worship and the devotion and the adoration that was due to him as the Son of God and as the Saviour. That's what Mary understood that day. 
that it's not enough just to follow Jesus' teachings. It's also <coughs> necessary to love and to adore and to worship him. If we're not worshipping Jesus, we're not obeying his teachings anyway. And worshipping him is, is really the only way we're going to shape our deeds to be like his. Uh, nevertheless, we do need to grapple with the, the teaching that Jesus alluded to that day. Uh, in a way, he seems to sideline the teaching about helping the poor, doesn't he? He said, well, you can do that anytime, but you don't always have me. However, I want us to, to know today that Jesus would not, would not sideline that, that teaching about the poor because it's actually his father's word. He quotes the Old Testament here from Deuteronomy 15, 11, where it says, There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy. This duty to be open-handed to the poor this to Jesus would have been a sacred duty. This was a word from his father God. So don't think that Jesus would have been sidelining the word. It was only because of the extraordinary significance of the moment that, that he said what he said. But the duty to help the poor is a real duty of every person who follows Jesus. And it should be on our hearts. So... How are you helping and how will you help? Uh, in asking this question, I just want to name the fact that uh, people are talking about a cost of living crisis here in Australia at the moment, and I believe it is real, and I believe it's impacting even in our relatively uh, well-off part of the, of the world. Uh, this crisis is impacting not only the people you traditionally think of as the poor, uh, but also people with mortgages uh, and, and many people who are just, you know, middle class people who are doing it really tough in the current environment. How can we help? Uh, I haven't thought of how to solve the crisis, uh, but I want to say that the more we know real people in real situations, the better we might know how we're able to help. Uh, we shouldn't think that we're helping merely by saying that, oh, the government should do such and such, or this other person should do such and such with their money. Uh, in, in fact, in a way, that's what Judas did, didn't he? Uh, giving to a, a charity like Anglicare or St Vinnie's is a good thing to do, though it doesn't usually lead to relationship with the person that you're helping. Helping a person in relationship is the best sort of help. Uh, one uh, relatively small opportunity that has come up uh, for us this week is that uh, the Presbyterian Church contacted Randwick Public School and asked them, look, are there any families who are doing it tough that we could provide a hamper for? Well, the school has come back and said, look, we know of four families that we could, that we could help. And as St Jude's decided, just our, our staff team decided, we'd like to put uh, a, a grocery voucher in each of those hampers to the value of at least $100. And I'm hoping that a person might just come and say, look, Andrew, here's the money for that, or here's the money for one of those vouchers. Now, look, that's, that is a relatively small thing that, that we can do. There, there are many, many more things we can do from that than that, but at least there's something where someone in the school community is going to receive something from the church uh, that, that they know is, is with, come with the love of Christ. Uh, it's, it's interesting that we're talking here about a grand gesture that Mary did for Jesus. There's a place for grand gestures, but often it's not grand gestures, but the ongoing support that happens in a relationship. I remember... Uh, listening to uh, some marriage advice from a marriage course that we run here at St Jude's a few times. Um, and they say, look, if your marriage is in trouble, don't do the grand gesture. Don't, don't go to Paris for a fortnight. and Don't do that. It's just the little things every day which make the difference. Uh, and for those around us, it's the little things every day. It's, it's not the grand gestures, but it's the love and the care in relationship. 
Now, I know that what I've said here on the cost of living crisis is, is minuscule, isn't it? It's minuscule. Uh, but it's helping people in relationship, uh, which is profoundly important and Christian. And if you can help out with those vouchers, talk to me at the door. Well, meanwhile, the, the tension in, uh, in this story about Jesus as he moves towards the cross just continues to mount, doesn't it? Um, and we read in the last few verses of today's passage how the sheer existence of Lazarus was just infuriating the leadership. Uh, Lazarus was literally living proof about the astonishing power of Jesus. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the Jewish leadership were plotting to kill Lazarus too. We never hear about how that plot uh, went. But we do know that the plot against Jesus was destined to be carried out only six days on from this time. Well, to conclude for this morning, uh, first of all, I think it's important just that this story is lodged in our minds that Mary did perform this extravagant act of devotion towards Jesus and that Jesus commended it because he is the Lord. He deserves it. Second, because Jesus is the Lord, he expects our devotion. It's not only good deeds that he wants from us, it's actually the devotion that treats him as my Lord and God. How do you show your devotion? Uh, I think an essential part of the devotion that he wants from us is prayer. But how can you be more like Mary, who just had this welling up desire to show her devotion to Jesus? Because she loved him for who he is. And that he is the saviour. Third of all, the command to help the poor is real and it was never abolished and it's highly relevant at this time. We need to work out ways of genuinely helping people, ways that go beyond just agitating for somebody else to do something and which really do help others as we have opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we feel profoundly inadequate to show the sort of devotion that your son Jesus deserves and to help those around us in what is a difficult time. We ask, please, for profound wisdom, selflessness, uh, uh, courage and generosity uh, that you might help us by your spirit to attempt these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Taking up our red hymn books again, our offertory hymn is hymn number 59. Let us stand and sing together.
Let us pray for all people and the church throughout the world. Spirit of God, active in creation, Spirit of Jesus, one with our Saviour, Spirit of life, present in the church, Spirit of love, hear our prayers today. God of truth, we thank you for the provision of your college as it trains men and women for a lifetime of discipleship and disciple making. We ask you, Lord, that both students and staff will grow in their knowledge of you and in humility and service towards others. May each member of the college work together under your direction so that the college functions well and the endeavours of all will bring many people to you. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Prince of Wales Hospital as it provides for the needs of many people under its care. We pray for all those who receive treatment that they may feel your loving healing power and those who provide services give of their very best for those in their care. Loving God, we are so grateful and thankful that we live in a state that allows scripture teaching in our schools. We pray that this opportunity will, opportunity will bear fruit as children and young people attend lessons. We pray that they will come to know you, our Lord, and accept your saving grace. Please support and encourage all scripture teachers as they prepare and deliver lessons each week. Help them to know how appreciated they are because of the life-saving mission teaching they are providing. A prayer for the Middle East. God of all nations, whose kingdom rules over all, have mercy on our broken and divided world. In the land of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, bring peace in our time, O Lord. In the land of our Saviour's birth, banish the spirit that makes for war. Please give wisdom to those you have placed in authority. Rescue the captives, shield those in danger and bind up the brokenhearted. For those fighting for justice, may they be strengthened by your grace. For those walking in darkness, may the light of your face shine upon them. We especially pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been caught in the crossfire in both Israel and Gaza. O Lord, preserve life and shelter to those who own and proclaim your name in those lands. Above all, we pray that the peoples of Israel and the Middle East will find everlasting hope in you and in the land of your sons redeemed in death and resurrection. Turn hearts to look to the Saviour and live. Bring peace, Lord, while we wait for the Christ coming and rule where all people will beat their swords into plowshares, where nations will not take up sword against nation and when every tear will be wiped away by the Prince of Peace and Lord of all. Turn to our yellow sheet. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially your servant, our King, his representatives and ministers, especially remembering our state MP, Marjorie O'Neill, his parliament and all who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Kanishka, our Archbishop, Michael, our Bishop, Andrew, our Rector, Andrew, Jim and Emma, that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. 
and to all your people give your heavenly grace and especially this congregation here present that they may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all named in our prayer journal and all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness or any other adversity. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. Mm -hmm. Almighty God, God, Father of God, our Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, make us all sin and judge of all people, Acknowledge the shame, the sins we have committed, and the thoughts, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent, and are heartily sorry for all our sins. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in the newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who in time of repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on us, pardon us the bitterness of all your children, confirm and strengthen us in your truth, and teach us Amen. Our next hymn is number 584, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Please stand and sing.
hear the words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. <coughs> Jesus said, Come to me all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. Lift up your heart. Make us unto the Lord. Let us give thanks for the Lord our God. Right. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, mighty creator and eternal God. For therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord, Lord most high. Let us pray together. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to do his Christ, Christ, that we may evermore dwell in him, in him he in us. He in us. Amen. Amen. All glory to you, our <coughs> Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
us pray. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom is the kingdom of power and the yours. Forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever living God, we heartily thank you that you graciously feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries. Through the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and thus assure us of your favour and goodness towards us, and that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom, by the merits of the most precious death and passion of your dear Son. And we humbly beseech thee, Heavenly Father, so to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen. <coughs> of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.